Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Well Church. We are very glad that you are here. Are you, are you glad that you're here? Good. Well, praise God. Welcome and happy Thanksgiving to you all. I know it's not actually Thanksgiving, but we won't see you that day. So happy Thanksgiving. We hope you have a great and blessed week. We also want to welcome you online as well. Uh, Friends, as always, if you'd like to connect with us in any way, we always encourage you to fill out our connection card. If you're here on campus, it's right there in front of you. And you can fill it out with praises or prayer requests or maybe some questions that you might have and put them in the little brown box in the foyer. And if you're online, again, a big welcome to you. And if you'd like to connect with us online, you can go to the wellyukapa.com to the sermon and blog tab and fill it out that way. Just three announcements for you this morning, the first of which is on December 4th, we're having a connections class. It'll be right after, actually not right after service, it's what, 2 o'clock? Two, yeah, what, what it says up there, I'm sorry. 2.30, uh, right here, and you can find out more information about our church or if you have questions, but it's especially important if you'd like to become a member of our church. Also on December 4th, we're going to be having a baptism service. So if you're interested in becoming, uh, being baptized, uh, definitely check in with the Church Center app or go to the gazebo for more information about that. And finally, the teens are going to winter camp, and they're raising funds right now uh, to go there uh, by, it's called Rent a Kid. It's not a lease to buy option. It's just you have, a, have one of the teens come to your house and rake leaves, do some yard work, some housework for a donation so they can go to winter camp. And you can see this young man right here, uh, Mr. Brandon, uh, whose birthday it is today, right? So happy birthday to you. So definitely check in with Brandon for more information. So with that being said, I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we read this month's Bible memory verse. Psalm 107, 7 through 9. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Psalm 107, 7 through 9. Father, we're always thankful, but especially during the season of, of Thanksgiving, we are so grateful for all the blessings you've given us, Lord. Lord, we, just, we can't even imagine what we'd be, where we'd be without you. Your unfailing love helps us, grows us, sustains us every single day. So with a heart of gratitude, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thankful for all you guys. Um, <clears throat> so we have a great cause and a great reason to be souls on fire this morning. Amen. Amen. We serve a great God who has come and died on the cross for us. And of course, he holds the victory over death as well, which was secured in his resurrection. So we have a great cause for rejoicing and celebrating our Lord and Savior today. So um, let us be souls on fire and people that would run after God's heart. Let's sing. Till I am a soul on fire 
forever. Amen, church? Amen. Hey, at this time, I want to invite you, if you're feeling led, to remain standing, or if you would like to, you may be seated at this time as well. Let's keep singing. Alone in my 
sorrowing dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over thank you that we are free. Your word tells us that who the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, and it is for freedom that you have set us free, Lord. It's the only place where we truly find our freedom. Everything else is a slave that keeps us from you. God, help us to 
die to sin and be alive to you this morning, Lord. We thank you that you have broken those chains that hold us, that we are free, and that um, you have given us a hope. You've given us a reason to sing, God, even in the midst of trials. We can trust in your goodness, Lord, for you are a foundation that will not be shaken. You are a hope that is from everlasting to everlasting. And Lord, you are life abundantly. So God, we have great reason to sing, great reason to rejoice this morning and to celebrate you. Lord, we thank you that you are in our midst. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would awaken our hearts and our minds, soften our hearts and our minds, God, to receive what you have for us today. God, would you transform us with your Spirit's power. And God, as we continue to worship you now in our time of, of giving, Lord, we recognize you as the provider and the sustainer of our lives. So God, help us to give with joy and gratitude now as we take our tithes and offerings, Lord. We, we take these to worship you, to recognize who you are and how you have provided, Lord. So use these means to further your kingdom here in our church, in our community, and in this world, Lord. Use these ties, use these offerings to accomplish, this, accomplish the purposes that you have set out, Lord. We surrender these, we give them to you. We give them with grateful hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're here with us this morning, you can worship through giving by filling out the offering envelopes that are in front of you, and you can drop those in the brown box on your way out. And if you're online, thank you for joining us. We're glad to worship with you in this way. Um, you guys can worship through giving by following the prompts that are across your screen now. Let's sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way When so i 
together. Father, it, it is indeed well with our soul. We come to this place together, bringing um, a whole lot of stuff with us this morning, Lord. There's, there's so much things going on in all of our lives, and um, it is good to know, Lord, that in the midst of all the difficulties that we face, you walk with us through those things, Lord. And, and even though circumstances aren't what we would want them to be, and even though there is turmoil around us and difficulties everywhere, Lord, we, we know that it is well with our soul. And so um, we pray, Lord, that this morning you would speak to us. We, would, we, we pray that we would recognize your presence here in our midst. And Lord, open our hearts to any message that you want to bring us this morning from your word. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I need to ask for your prayer. Oh, for the youth. If you're in 6th to 12th grade, you can be dismissed and go with Brandon over there. And we're, you can have your youth group at this morning. So, all right. So, we can... As these guys lead, you can pray for Brandon this, this morning. Um, I've been um, feeling a little bit under the weather, so pray for my voice today that I'll be able to get all the way through this today. And um, pray for my wife, too. We, she's been sick for a couple of weeks. She has bronchitis, and so um, so no, no hugging or anything after the service today for me. So I'll just wave at you all now. And... Um, not being antisocial any more than normal. So, um, um, so a couple of things just really quickly before we get started. There, there's two things, two announcements you heard earlier. One is about a connections class on December 4th. Uh, if you're new to the well and would like to come and find out everything about the well that you ever wanted to know, um, where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed, please come and join us. It'll be on the 4th of December, and we'll be uh, meeting... Um, over in the, the dining room over here. So and it'll be fun. Um, as I tell everyone every time, there will be chocolate. So um, please sign up for that online, or you can also sign up um, at the gazebo after service. And also we're having baptisms. If you're a believer in Christ and you've never been baptized before, we'd like to offer that opportunity to you. And um, that's going to be um, also on December the 4th. And so if you're interested in that, you can um, shoot me an email or you can sign up for that online or also at the gazebo after service today. So um, today um, we come to the end of our study of the Gospel of Mark. We've been working our way all the way through verse by verse, and we do that um, um, essentially because that's really all that we got. We, we study the scriptures, and um, the scriptures are what we build our lives on. It's not about me being the greatest creative presenter in the world or anything like that. It's about following after what God says, and we, we want to follow and listen to him as we go through. So we're finishing up our study of the book, book of Mark. It's taken the better part of this whole year, actually, as we've gone through it. And um, as, as I was reading through this, um, and, and you can see the, the title of today's sermon is A Sticky Wicket. I, I was reading through the the this passage and some things came out about the passage and I said well that's a sticky wicket and I don't know why I thought that because that's that is not how many of you have used that phrase this week okay yeah this millennial how many of you have used that but but it came to me in my head in an English accent oh boy that's a sticky wicket that we've got ourselves into so it's like what in the world? Who knows what a sticky wicket is? Is it a croquet thing? No, it's not a croquet thing. But it's a, it's a difficult situation. We do have one guy that knows. You're the only guy in both services because have you spent... Yes, it's, it's a pub. But still, it's not the meaning of the word, though, because I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking of that. 
Although it might be better to understand it if you went to a pub and did a little of this before, and then you could understand it. But let me tell you what a sticky wicket is. Because we all know it's like kind of a, a difficult situation, right? It, that's what your intuition tells you. Oh, it's kind of a difficult situation. Let me tell you what a sticky wicket is. A sticky wicket is a metaphor used to describe a difficult circumstance. It originated as a term for a difficult circumstances in the sport of cricket. Yay. All right. <laughs> Who's your favorite cricket team? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. But it's caused by, a sticky wicket is caused by a damp and soft wicket. That clears it right up. <laughs> the phrase comes from the game of cricket. Wicket has several meanings in cricket. In this case, it refers to the rectangular area, also known as the pitch in the center of the cricket field between the stumps. And you say, oh, that makes it clear. It's in between the stumps, of course. The wicket is usually covered in a much shorter grass than the rest of the field or entirely bare, making it susceptible to variations in weather, which in turn cause the ball to bounce differently. Now in cricket, it's kind of like baseball with hockey rules and a little ice skating somewhere in there. I don't know, but, but, but they throw in cricket, they, they run up and they throw the ball like a hook shot and then they bounce the ball into the area called the wicket. And then it bounces up to where the batter is. And they have like, I don't know, the rules are something like playing football with a hockey bat and, and, and they have this bat, and the guy is, the, it's called the battery, the batter, and, and he hits with this thing after it bounces off the ground. Okay. But wait, there's more. <laughs> the wicket is covered in much shorter grass than the rest of the field, or entirely bare, making it susceptible to variations in weather, which in turn cause the ball to bounce differently. Oh. If the rain falls and the wicket becomes wet, the ball may not bounce predictably, making it very difficult for the batsman. Batsman. Furthermore, as the pitch dries, conditions can change swiftly, with spin bowling being especially devastating. Oh. <laughs> Remember that if you ever get a sticky wicket, you can do some spin bowling, because it's especially devastating as the ball can deviate laterally from straight by several feet. Once, <laughs> once the wet surface begins to dry in a hot sun, the ball will rise sharply, steeply, and erratically. A good length ball becomes a potential lethal delivery. <laughs> the laughing is the hardest thing. Okay. All right. A good length ball becomes potentially lethal, uh, a, potentially, a potentially lethal delivery. Most batsmen on such wickets found it virtually impossible to survive, let alone score. I I'm just reading this, okay? Certain cricketers developed reputations for their outstanding abilities to perform on sticky wickets. Australian Victor Trumper was one. Today, we come to a difficult text to understand, all right? In our, in our scripture readings today, as I was reading through, it, it became a sticky wicket for me as I was reading through this. And I was thinking, oh, okay, because it kind of sent me off on a little exploration to find out what sticky wicket meant. That's why this is related in. And so really what we're going to talk about today is kind of a sticky wicket. It's a little unpredictable and it's a little bit different and out of our comfort zones than probably what we're used to when we're studying the scriptures. Okay, so I want you to stay with me. I want you to know that I am a fully grounded evangelical with an or orthodox view of the scriptures. So don't worry. Okay. But, and, and, and in fact, you know, 
as we look at this sticky wicket today, the Bible is, I, I have to remind you, is the centerpiece of our faith. And it leads us to a proper understanding of who God is and a proper understanding um, of his interaction with people. And a proper guide to grow in our lifetime of following him. So, so I want to say this at the outset. The scripture is reliable. It leads us in sp- spiritual formation and service in God's kingdom. That is our, our thinking going into this. So we come to today's scripture in Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. It says this. When, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Now, I want you to notice how this text sounds different from what we've been reading up to this point. Um, just the actual cadence, the syntax, the grammar, all of it has changed from what we were reading before. It just seems almost like someone else was writing it. Verse 10, she, she went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they didn't believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. These guys were just a bunch of doubting Thomases. Verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's a key phrase right there. I, um, we're going to come back and unpack that a little bit because um, there's some things about that that you need to know. We'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. In, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord had spoken to them, he's taken in, up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And then the disciples came out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that, that accompanied it. And that is the end of the gospel of Mark. Now, Most theologians, most scholars of the scriptures believe that the gospel of Mark ended at verse 8. So here's the sticky wicket. What about verses 9 through 20? What is up with that? You're standing up here, pastor, as a preacher, telling me that part of the Bible is not right or not shouldn't be there or doesn't belong um yeah that's kind of what i'm saying and um and it's interesting because um as as we we talk about this it's like well how in the world can you just like pick out some parts of the bible and and not use them that's that's kind of tricky but most of your bibles that you have um will say that these verses 9 through 20 did not appear in the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have. So what in the world do we do with that? Because that's kind of, that's a kind of a precarious place to look at. Um, If you have an NIV Bible, an ESV Bible, um, probably a New Living Translation, uh, probably New American Standard, um, any of the newer translations, they all will say that in them, that these verses were probably not in the original. King James does include that in, but some of the King James versions actually have the same notification. So what do we do to the, with this passage? Um, there's a couple of obvious things we wanna, I want to talk about, first of all. Um, that These events, a lot of these that you read in here, especially like the snake part, Okay, man, I hate snakes. Snakes and sharks and clowns. We we will never have any snake handling here in um, 
you know, in this, you're welcome. And it's my pleasure, actually. So um, there are places like in Kentucky right now that they have snake handling as a very important part of their services. And there are lots of dead pastors in Kentucky who were had <laughs> snake pa- handling in their churches. Um, I don't know why the snakes bit them. Perhaps they didn't have enough faith. Or perhaps they were just dinguses and God was just thinning the herd a little. I don't know. Um, These verses are descriptive and not prescriptive. The difference is describing something that happened different than telling people to do these things. If you read through this in its proper reading, just in a straightforward reading, it just explains some of the things that happened. There is another part in the book of Acts where Paul reached down by a fire and a snake bit him on the hand. Remember that? He just shook it off. He did the Taylor Swift and shook it off. And that's a pop culture reference for those of you who are not there. He threw it back in the fire. The snake, you know, went off. And I heard that there was a, a, a snake bit Chuck Norris, and after four days of agonizing pain, the snake died. (laughs) So this is describing, okay, this is describing something that happened. The speaking in tongues, it describes something that happened. Driving out demons, healing people at, at their volition is something that happened doesn't happen so much anymore. Do I believe God can heal people? Of course I do. I I see God healing people all the time, but I don't necessarily know that. The way that people use it, it's like they're going to do it and and just use it as a um, kind of as a prop. Um, The truth of the matter is that, um, that people don't get healed all the time. And God knows what he's doing. And we have to put our faith in God in the outcome, not necessarily on our um, beliefs. Now, so these are just things. um, Also, the believe and be baptized. Um, Some people say, oh, you have to be baptized to be saved. Um, But then right after it says, whoever does not believe will be condemned. So essentially, the the Greek, the structure of the Greek in that, it, it, it just says you should be you, you, get, you believe and get saved and then be baptized. It's kind of the way that that should go. It doesn't translate real well into the English. All the other, the massive verses all through the New Testament will tell you that you believe and are saved. This verse says it in a backwards way, but this verse most likely didn't even exist in the original writings of, Matthew, of Mark. So, so that's kind of where we're going, is that most likely these verses 9 through 20 were not in the original gospel that Mark wrote. And you're thinking, well, pastor, how, how can you say that? You know, what is this dispute with this longer ending of Mark? How did this come about? Well, we have right now uh, over 5,000 early manuscripts that are written of the New Testament, 5,000. To put that in context, for, for Homer's writings, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's um, less than 20 manuscripts. And no one debates about what the, the Iliad and Odyssey are saying. For the New Testament, we have 5,000 different manuscripts. And that's how they create what the, what the New Testament says. And so what would happen is these guys would copy down stuff, the copyists, and 4,999 would write one thing, and then one person would write another. They would compare these and say, well, look, this guy doesn't match with the other 5,000. This is probably not correct. So that's how they, they, they cobble that together. That's how they got what we believe is the New Testament. Now, I'll tell you how this probably came about in just a minute. But the earliest manuscripts that were written closest to the time that Mark actually wrote this. We don't have the original ones because time has destroyed the original ones, but the earliest ones don't contain these verses 9 through 20. They just don't have them. So for hundreds of years, there's no 9 through 20, and then a few hundred years later, all of a sudden 9 through 20 pops in. 
So they're probably thinking that someone else added this in later. I'll tell you how they may have done that in just a second. So this causes problems, though. If you're reading this, you might think, well, what about the reliability of scriptures then? How can I believe that the scriptures are reliable? How how can I believe that these things are really the reliable word of God? And so we, we have to go back and see how the scriptures were compiled. And we're going to just take a little journey here while we do this, because I want to, um, I, 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 most of all, I want you to know that the scriptures that we have are very reliable. In fact, if you took all of the, the passages of the New Testament that anyone has any kind of question about, like these, and you put them on an 8 by 11 piece of paper, it would take about a half a page. That would be all the contested things. And none of them really can contest any major doctrine of scripture. Okay, so, so that is just, um, and, and there's really good, perfectly good explanations for all of those things if you take the time to sit and analyze them, okay? We don't have time to do critical theory about the, um, about the scriptures. We, we're not going to do that today. That's a seminary class for people with pointy heads and stuff to discuss, all right? So we're not going to go down that road. Okay, but but I want to I want to you to leave here with a with a reassurance that the scriptures that we have are accurate, even if there are portions like this nine through twenty that some people might say ah that probably didn't exist because it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts that we have of the copies of the New Testament. So the question here is 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 what do we believe about the Bible? Okay, and so this church has founded on on the belief that the Bible is the inerrant, accurate, reliable word of God. It's the first item in our statement of faith. And and so what do we believe about the Bible? We teach and we believe that the Bible is inspired, inerrant word of God. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be inspired. It's inerrant in its original writings, and it's the word of God. It's God's message to us. Um... Why is that important? Well, it's important because everything that we do is based on that. If any decision that we make as a church, we go back always to this first principle. Is this something that violates a a tenet of Scripture? Does it affirm scriptural teachings about God? Does it affirm scriptural teachings about our church? And should we be doing this based on the Bible? The Bible is our first line of defense for that. And it also tells us everything that we need to know for life and godliness, we, we get from the Scriptures, So it's the inspired, inerrant word of God, his full written revelation, and it's our rule of faith and practice. So that's where we are with the scripture. So we're not some you know, weird cult that distorts or twists around the scriptures. But we also want to make sure that we are following the scriptures that were passed down. Okay? So does this change our view of scripture? Um, well... I, I don't believe that it does. Um, the, the, the fact, this fact that verses 9 to 20 are not in the earliest, best manuscripts, does it change how we view scriptures? It does not at all. The answer is very important because it's going to set the foundation of all that we believe and practice as a church. So we have to ask this question, what is scripture? You know, why, why, do, why do people always say, go read the Bible? I, you know, people say that all the time, right? If you're having trouble and you want to find out more about God, go read the Bible. It's not a punishment, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, go to your room and, you know, read the Bible four times. You know, um, that's not what God does in the Bible. In the book of the, the Bible, the scriptures that we have, they're not so much a, a, a field manual of how to do life, but it's a love letter written from God to us. And, and we find out about the heart of God in the middle of scriptures. So what is scripture exactly to us? Well, Peter, you know, Peter was the leader of the, the, the first church. And Peter was um, one of the, the apostles of Jesus. And he was the ready, fire, aim guy. That Jesus said something, he just did it and then thought about it later on. And, and this is what Peter said about the scriptures, verse 
2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. He said, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. So these guys that wrote the Bible, they didn't just make up stuff and write it down. Verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin um, in the human will, but prophets, through, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know the exact um, method of how this looked. I mean, it wasn't like all of a sudden, I mean, we don't know. It may have been that they fell into a trance, just wrote down stuff. I don't know if it was that or if they, God was just speaking to their heart as they were writing the things down. But what I do know is that God motivated them in some way and, and the words that they wrote became the scriptures. And even though they were human, the spirit carried them using their own styles, oftentimes their own personality to transmit God's inerrant truth to people through their writings. And, and I do know in, in a linguistic study of this passage of Mark, it's a whole different writing style than the rest of the book. The, the grammar that he uses is different. The descriptions, his, even his, his style, his syntax, it's all different. So it almost is like someone else inserted this in there. If, if you could read it in the original Greek, that's, it's a pretty contrasting kind of a, of a writing, okay? So, so we believe that the, that the scripture was written down by men who were filled with the spirit and carried along by the spirit. It was God's message to us, perfectly delivered to these people who perfectly wrote it down. So it's not about the content of this. It's about how it was finalized. So how was the New Testament finalized? And I just want to talk about the New Testament now. Well, the, the Old Testament is a whole other ball of wax. Now, what does ball of wax mean? I looked it up and no, no, sorry. Okay, okay sorry, sorry. I want to do that. Okay, all right. <laughs> People say that kind of stuff. It's like all the time, it's a whole other ball of wax. What does that mean? <clears throat> Anyways, we need to be careful when we say stuff. All right. So how was the New Testament finalized? Hold on here. We're going to, I'm going to make, my voice is going to make it through. So one of my goals in life, in my marriage, is to make my wife laugh every day. It's one of my goals, every day. And it's very problematic in many ways, sometimes I'm not funny, she, she informs me. Um, but, but the other thing is that when you have bronchitis and you make someone laugh, and then they laugh, and then you laugh, and you just, you laugh, go, ha, 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 and then you hack for about 15 minutes. So I had to kind of tone it back just a little bit. So, but again, that's another ball of wax. So, um, so how was the New Testament finalized? The New Testament is a collection of books. It's 27 different books written by several different authors, okay? We call it the New Testament canon. I, theologians make up strange words to confuse everyone, but this is called the canon, okay? And it doesn't mean you take the Bible out and blast people with it. You know, it's like, okay, believe or else I'm going to just blast you with it. It's not that. A canon, it actually comes from a Greek word that means a reed, like a, um, a reed in a pond, Okay, and they eventually, they plucked those reeds out and they turned them into rulers. Okay, and, and they were measuring sticks, basically. And the word canon meant one of those. It's a measuring stick. So the New Testament canon is a measuring stick of what we have, the, the church through the years, compiled a group of writings that this was the conforming to the word of God. There's other things that were written, a lot of other books, you know, the, there's a lot of Christian books out there right now, right? You guys have read books? Nod your heads, please do. You're scaring me a little. Okay, all right. So, yes, you've read books, and some of them are great and lead you to the heart of God. Some of them are um, hooey, okay? And that is the, the, the Hebrew word that means malarkey, okay? <laughs> and so some books are good and some books are not. There's an old ancient book called the Gospel of, of Peter. And then there's one called the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of, of, of Peter were books that just didn't fit in with the message. You could obviously tell that, that someone was just like 
smoking mushrooms or something when they wrote it. It was just was not right, okay? And so, I don't know, do you smoke mushrooms? I, I don't, you can tell my experience in the drug culture is rather minimal, okay? So, like, the book of Peter, for example, says that, um, um, that someday that perhaps maybe even women can enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah, so they said, no, no, no. A lot of them were married and said, we're not putting that in there. So they, they could see that there are some things that are clearly not scriptural. And so by the first couple of hundred years, they really had a group of books that were 27 books that they said, these are clearly the scriptures. And the, and the church codified it and said, these are the books. And they, they eliminated the spurious ones and put these in together. So this canon, it meant the official standard by which they're all measured. And so they put together this New Testament in three different phases. Okay, the first phase was in oral stories and writing. And that went from about the year 30 to the year of 90. The year 30 was about the year that Jesus was crucified, around 29 or 30 AD, he was crucified. And so um, they had stories. And then they started writing these stories down. Do you know what the first book of the New Testament that was written is? Yeah. Um, no one knows exactly when, but probably, most likely, um, 1 Thessalonians. Interesting. So you, you were here first service. So yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, no, he just was here for a service. And you're on my list still, dude. I just want you to know. So I'm not going to tell everybody what you said, but you're on my list. Okay, so. Uh, and I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell her what you said. All right. Yeah, you're on the list, dude. All right, so, all right. So, 1 Thessalonians was probably the first book. It was written about AD 79. So, Less than 20 years after, G, after Jesus was crucified, the first New Testament book was written. That's really close, 20 years. You guys can remember back 20 years. You know, that's the year 2003 or 2002. Not real good at math. So, all right. So Galatians was written around the same time and Mark the Gospel of Mark, which we're just finishing up, was written about that same time. So these are early books within like 20 years of the life of Christ. And, you know, you can remember stuff that long ago. Most of the New Testament books were written, you know, the last New Testament book was Revelation. And it was written, they're guessing, sometime between 65 and 90. Some, there's a camp that says it was written as late as 90. And, and so that's just 60 years after Jesus um, was crucified. And that came not as a recollection, but it came as a revelation of, uh, to the Apostle John. But most of everything else was written um, somewhere between the, the time of 30 to 60 um, to 70 AD. So a period of about 30 or 40 years. And then, you know, but even up to 60 years, you could remember stuff from 60 years ago, right? Mom, you remember when I was 60 years ago, I was two. Yes, I'm 62. I can help you with that math. And so 60 years ago, and I was a cute little guy, wasn't I? Yes, yes, I was. My, how things change. So, um, so, but you can remember, you can remember, Mom, when I was two years old, right? You do, right? And, and you could tell stories, but you won't, <laughs> about me as a little kid, right? Okay. Yeah, we're not telling those stories. But see, you could write, you could probably write a book of stories about your kids that would be fairly accurate, okay? Even from 60 years ago. So this is not out of the realm that these things were written. They were written pretty close to when it happened. You, you have an eyewitness picture. Maybe some of the details were a little fuzzy, but really you, you get a pretty good picture. So even without the spirit of God carrying you along, you can do this. 
So these oral stories were collected into writings and, and they were written down, but they didn't capture every single thing about the life of Jesus. Now we've, we've read the, um, the, the, we've seen on TV the, the Chosen series. Have any of you seen that series about the Chosen? They add in some details to the story that aren't in the scriptures. You know, there are things that Jesus did that weren't recorded in the scriptures. In fact, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. But these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, here's the key of the New Testament for us, is that the things that were written down, that there's no dispute about, those things were written and attested to by witnesses, and verified by the people that were there, they were written so that you would have faith in Jesus. And, and see, this is the important thing we have to remember about the New Testament. The purpose of the New Testament is so that we would have faith in Jesus Christ. And the stuff that is written is written clearly enough. John 21, verse 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for all the books that could, that would be written. Okay, so, so the stuff that we need to know, God made sure was written in the New Testament. The stuff in Mark 16, 9 through 20 that may be contestable is actually affirmed in other places in the Bible that these things happened. The third phase after the oral stories and writing and then the, the collection and copying, well, or the second thing, sorry, is the collection and copying. Um, this is what, they, they took all of these books and, and, and they said, wow, these are great writings. We should make records of them and make copies to send them around. So they would have people that were copyists. And a lot of times they would copy these New Testament things. And for 200 years, they, they copied it as it was. And one guy in the margin wrote, verses 9 through 20, because he was remembering the stuff that happened through other stories in the Bible. And he wrote it in the margin as he was copying. They, they have actual manuscripts with writings in the margins. And then lo and behold, they passed it on to the next one. The guy's getting ready to make a copy. He sees these notes in the margin and says, oh, I should include that in right here. And so in some of them, so we, we have these extra added in things that appear in the later manuscripts. That is the reason that most people believe these verses exist. But when they collected them and they copied them, they had this, this, this it was called a corpus of, of literature, the body of the literature, and they collected it together and they began to recognize that there were some of them that just rang so true that these were really the words of God and they called them scripture. They used the same words of scripture as they used for the Old Testament Bible that they had. And Peter actually said that what Paul wrote was scripture. In 2 Peter 3.16, he's talking about Paul Peter, you know, they got past their differences. And, 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 and Peter said, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. <laughs> I've read some of those things that ignorant and unstable people wrote. They distort it as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. See, Peter was saying the stuff that Paul wrote is the same as the scriptures. It had the same weight as the Old Testament scriptures. So these guys were working together. They were not at odds. They had a picture of what they wanted to accomplish. And I believe it was at this stage of putting these debated sections, adding and maybe deleting what needed to be not right that this was put in. Okay, so... They had the oral, oral stories in writing. They had the collection and copying. And then they had the established canon. Okay, the canon, again, was the, what they decided. Now, from the mid-200s, 
There were stories of people that had all the, the, most of the books were already selected. There was a couple of books that they were trying to weed in and out, but really by the mid 200s, it was all set. And, and finally, the 27 book New Testament was formally canonized during the Council of Hippo in Carthage in North Africa. They brought together all of the church leaders and said, these are the books that we're going to lead as a church. We're going to, we believe these are the authentic words of God. And so they put them together. Now, that's what, 300 um, years after Jesus Christ. Um, You know, our Constitution of the United States, we have it pretty well laid out what it is, and everyone knows what the original Constitution was, right? So we have it, and it's 300 years old. So it's the same amount of time. This is not something that just happened later on that guys just made up stuff and just threw in there. These are things that had been worked through church councils and, and great discussion, and they put it together. There was one church at the time. Everyone was focused in on finding what the truth was at this time. So... Here's the question about today's passage. What do we do with Mark 16, 9 through 20? What do you do with it? Okay, here's what you do with it. First of all, we need to recognize it's probably not not, um, part of the original writings. It was added later by a scribe or a copyist. Okay, it's a very easily understood mistake. Doesn't mean even that all the stuff in there is wrong, but it's not... um, We'll come to that later on. The, the, the second thing is that it contains no essential um, beliefs, and it's not corroborated by the rest of the scriptures. So the, there's nothing in there that is not at least alluded to in the rest of the scriptures. If you compare it with the rest of the Bible, um, the, the only thing with the exception of the believe and be baptized part, everything else, all of those things are attested to by other parts of the scriptures. So it really doesn't add anything. But, but don't take it as something that you need to go bust out some rattlesnakes or drink poison. You know, that's just silliness. You know, God has not called us to do those kinds of things. It's like, I, I, I believe God will protect me, but I don't play marbles on the freeway. Okay. So we interpret scripture with scripture. Um, you, anything that you read in scriptures, you see what the bulk of the other scriptures say. And if there's one thing that's kind of questionable and all the other, the rest of the things point to one thing, you, you don't just build a whole doctrine on that last debatable passage. Okay. We compare scripture with scripture. The stuff that we really know is, is, is absolute truth. What the bulk and preponderance of scripture is, we use that to form our, our valuation of stuff that might be questionable. There's one, this one passage says, you know, believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. Almost every single other New Testament passage says, believe and you'll be saved. So, you, so you, it's really important that, that we're very careful when we're building our doctrine and that we don't just pick and choose stuff out of the scriptures, okay? We don't build our doctrinal stands on debatable passages. So it, it begs this question, and, and how does this affect our belief in scriptures as the word of God, right? How, how does this passage, this 9 through 20, if it's not there, how does that affect us? Does it, does it crush us? Does it tell us that the rest of the Bible is not um, trustworthy? And here's how it affects us. It affects us not at all. Not at all. Um, again, this is just a minor thing that's not validated or corroborated with other verses of scripture. This doesn't invalidate the whole, okay? And in fact, for, for thousands of years now, they've said, this is probably not a part of scripture, okay? So what is the purpose of scripture then? What, what is, we, we know what it is, it's this God-breathed thing, but what's the, what's the, what does it do in our lives? Is it something that when I say to you, you should spend time in the Bible every day, do, is that something I do just to make you feel guilty? Because I know sometimes... Sometimes if I don't read the Bible, okay, don't tell anyone this. But sometimes I don't read the Bible every day. I know, 
gasp, <laughs> horror of horrors. It's a whole nother ball of wax. So, all right. I know, there's, it's everywhere. So, um, I, I, most days I do. I just want to reassure you that, you know, most days I do. But sometimes I don't. And honestly, I feel kind of guilty when I don't. But, but if we go back to what the purpose of Scripture is, maybe we don't have to feel so guilty about not reading it every single day. And I'm not saying, oh, pastor said I don't have to read the Bible. <laughs> it's like you're going down the highway and there's a sharp curve and it's 25 miles an hour speed limit. You probably should go 25 around the corner. I mean, you might make it around without if you go 40. Probably not at 50. You might skid off the road at 60. You know, off you go. The the scripture reading, it's not legalistic, but I'm telling you what, you better spend time in the word because it transforms your soul. That's all I'm going to say about that. So what is the purpose of scripture? Timothy Young Timothy, Paul's young Padawan, he said this in 2 Timothy 3.16. He said, all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we have the scriptures. It's God-breathed. The, the, the Old Testament word ruach. Is a, it's, the, it's the breath of God into our lives. And it's useful for a few things. Here's what it's useful for. It's useful for teaching, to impart knowledge about how to live the Christian life. It's good to read the Word of God. It tells you what you're supposed to do. It's good for rebuking, um, pointing out the errors in belief and behavior. A lot of people do more rebuking than teaching. They, they should on people all around them. You should, 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 should. And they, they use the Bible as a club to beat people into conformity with the way that they believe things. They just go around rebuking. I rebuke you, rebuke, rebuke. You know, if people just are doing that all the time, I don't listen to them. It's like, oh, that's nice. Talk to the hand, you know. That's what we used to say in the 90s or something like that, 80s. 76, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so, you know, I, I, when people are rebuking me all the time, it's like Charlie Brown's teacher, man. And I, I just don't, I just shut them out. I don't listen to them. It's like preaching after 40 minutes. <laughs> rebuking, correcting. Now, showing the right path for a person to take is a little different. It's like, you know, some people always say you shouldn't do this, but maybe they could, you could help them to say, this might be a better choice. Give them options. That's what the Bible does. And then training in righteousness, that's how to walk the path. You know, correcting is telling them where to go. Training is telling them how to walk the walk to get to where they need to go. And so what's the outcome? It's for God's people to be equipped for every good work. I said this earlier, and, and, and this is kind of the main point that I, I want you to get today. Regardless of these disputable passages, that Scripture is reliable, and it leads us to spiritual formation and service in, kings, in God's kingdom. You can, you, the, the Scripture is reliable. You can depend on the Bible, and it's going to help you to develop spiritually into the person you need to be, and it's going to equip you for service. It's going to point out to you places that you need to be serving. All right. So we come to the end of the Gospel of Mark. Okay? It's done. And it was written as a call to action for people who lived in Rome. It was written to the Christians who are in Rome. And remember that Rome was this wicked capital of of the nation that was oppositional to Jesus and his gospel and his people. My, my friends, we live in a society that's not real um, amenable to the message of, of Christ. The world we live in is really not against, is not really for the things that we're for. 
But the problem here is that we think that we're suffering this great persecution. How many of you have suffered great persecution for the sake of Jesus? Interesting. The people that Mark were writing to were being thrown to the lions, given a sword, and say, fight a lion with a sword. The people that Mark was writing to were people that were dipped in oil, hung up on a lamppost, and lit on fire to light the way into Rome at night, just because they were Christians. So while there are some similarities, there are also some pretty significant differences. Um, I, I believe we're headed in that direction. I, I don't see it really widespread just yet, but I see it coming. And so the question is, as things are coming, how are you preparing in your heart to deal with real persecution when it comes? Because it's not like you're going to wake up one day and say, oh, okay, I'm ready. You know, um, if we can't handle the persecution we're having at this level, what's going to happen when they up the ante? What's going to happen is it's going to be a, a weeding out of the people who are really Christians or not Christians, you know? Um, I think last week our guest speaker said we're either missionaries or imposters. And I think that that was pretty convicting for me. What are we in that? So <clears throat> the question for the audience of Mark is the same question, though, that we need to ask ourselves 2,000 years later. What are you going to do with the person of Jesus? What are you going to do? We just finished studying his life through the book of Mark. What are you going to do about that? Um, it, it doesn't mean, um, here's another word, diddly squat. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what that means because that's a scary one just from thinking about it. But, but, but really, if we have all this knowledge about Jesus and we do nothing about it, it doesn't mean diddly squat to anything. So what are you going to do about this? This gospel what are you going to do with Jesus? Listen, I believe that this Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. R regardless of any of the rest of all y'all, Jesus died to pay for my sins. I, I believe that, and I have enough. I believe that he was buried in a tomb, and he raised from the dead on the third day. And I believe that he gives me forgiveness for my past, and he gives me strength to live through today, and he gives me a bright hope for tomorrow. Those three things are the culmination of Jesus' work in my life. There's forgiveness, there's strength, and there's hope. And that is what the Gospel of Mark is about. And so in light of this gospel, I, I want to just ask you today, what's going to be your response? I, I pray that your response will be to believe and receive and follow Jesus. And I believe that this record that we have, this, this inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God in our lives will draw us closer into God and that we can love our neighbors as well through this time because that's what's going to make it it's going to help us to make it through this time it's not going to be being right it's not going to be you know being you know pulling out the sword like peter and lopping off people's ears it's going to be about how well we love our neighbors and that's what's going to bring people to the kingdom of god all right so my friends um what's going to be your response um if you don't know Jesus, I, I, I beg of you to receive Christ as your Savior. Believe in him. Believe that he died for your sins and receive him and, and follow him. If you're a Christian and you've just been um, goofing off as a Christian, um, I, my encouragement for you is that you would follow Jesus without equivocation. Follow after Jesus. Let him be the meaningful core root of your life. All right, so let's pray together and then we'll sing one more song together and be dismissed. Um, Father, we just, um, we, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the story of Jesus's life and how he, he worked um, on this earth, how he 
lived a sinless life and, and, and died on the cross to pay the debt for our sin that we couldn't pay. And Lord, we believe that he was buried and rose again on the third day. And we ask, Father, that um, you would help us to follow after Jesus. Help us to know him more. Lord, help us to, to spend our, our days and our time and, and, and our talent and our treasure, Lord, to follow after him. Thank you, Lord, for your great gift to us. Help us to follow after you. In Christ's name, amen. If you would like to find out how to have a relationship with Jesus, we have folks at the front that would love to pray with you. If you have issues in your life you need prayer for, we have prayer for you today. And um, we would just like for you to come forward at the end of service and, and talk to somebody. And um, we just thank you all for being here. I appreciate your, your time and your attention. And um, let, let's follow Jesus. Let's follow him. So let's stand together and um, let's sing one more song and we'll be dismissed. And Lord, haste the day.